Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Well, hello everybody. It's a great day to travel on the Chicago Footprint. Thank you for joining us today on World Footprint Radio. We're your hosts, Tanya Nancy Patrick, and we're broadcasting from our studio in the Metro Washington, D.C. area today, but we're bringing you a show from around the world, literally. On today's show, Natasha Alam of the HBO hit series True Blood stops by to share her life-changing journey from Uzbekistan to Hollywood and her heart for humanity. Then Canadian singer-songwriter Elizabeth Elming sits down for a conversation on her globe-trotting career that has taken her to music halls from Toronto to London. And finally, Antonio Graceffo, also known as the Monk from Brooklyn, left Wall Street after 9-11 to become a martial arts student and anthropologist and joined us from Vietnam to discuss his latest book, television and film projects, and his life as a global citizen. As always, if you have a question or a comment, write to us at comments at worldfootprints.com. And indeed, we're bringing you an all-star cast today, and of course, you are the star of our show, and we look forward to connecting with you during the week on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Stitcher, a mobile app that lets you listen to us on the go and on any mobile device. So join us on all our social networks and sign up for our newsletter at worldfootprints.com. Our next guest career has been soaring, and you've probably seen her on any number of shows like Entourage or The Unit, or perhaps in the hit movie The Women. But today you can see Natasha Alam on HBO's hit drama True Blood, where she plays Iveta, Alexander's new love interest. Natasha has had a fascinating journey from Uzbekistan to Hollywood, and we're so happy to welcome her to our show. Здравствуйте, Наташа. Как поживаете? Oh, very, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a surprise. I didn't expect. Um, I'm very good. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I, I want to say that I am so uh, happy to be on the show. Oh, we're we're thank so you. happy to have you here, and and, uh, and thank you for indulging my bad Russian. I try to <laughs> practice where I can. <laughs> I was. A, had a very sweet accent. I uh, love that. Oh, bless. Now, you've come such a long way from Uzbekistan. What was it like growing up there? Well, um, uh, Uzbekistan is uh, part of USSR, former USSR, and um, it's a, actually a, um, a Muslim country. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, I was growing up foreign in my own country because the language was uh, everyone who lived there mostly is uh, Uzbeki nationality, and I was brought up, brought there from, um, well, actually my grandparents moved there um, uh, to help out for the, uh, the, the culture mm-hmm. of Uzbekistan when Uzbekistan was not, uh, back in like uh, 1917, mm-hmm. um, when Uzbekistan was just growing young country. So I was growing up in a a Muslim country, uh, and it was a little bit of a problem with um, ra- racism at that time. Mm. So it was, I remember it was even tough to like sometimes to go to school because you'd have to um, hide behind the bushes to get to the, to, to school safely because that, uh, local boys were just like growing up hating um, mm. Everyone from uh, a, a Russian Federation, mm. uh, and um, yeah, we had problems on the streets all the time. Crime. My my sister was raped a couple of times. So it was a tough time mm-hmm. growing up. But um, uh, other than that, I loved Uzbekistan for um, uh, amazing food and <laughs> um, uh, the weather is. It's fantastic. Um, the mountains are so beautiful. The nature. Mm-hmm. Um, there are great things uh, in that country that just um, was really, really exotic to me. Modeling was a really your ticket out of Uzbekistan, and I'm wondering if that helped you, if modeling helped you adjust to the new culture that you experienced when you moved to Europe. Yeah, I was studying at the um, um, University of Aviation because my mom thought I have I should have like a very serious uh, job in the future, <laughs> and um, 
uh, soon enough I realized that mechanic on the plane uh, is not really my thing. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I started taking um, college at the same time for uh, fashion design. And uh, uh, on, uh, during that time, we were like making our own clothes and kind of like uh, um, modeling it in front of our college. And then uh, from that, it, it grew into a bigger thing, and we started uh, performing in front of like um, um, local, um, 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 uh, bigger venues, and uh, and then we start traveling, touring around the, like local cities. Um, so eventually, I made my way to Moscow, and um, uh, got lucky and entered into um, biggest agency of that time, mm -hmm. which uh, eventually. Um, uh, I got scouted by Italian agency and moved to um, uh, uh, to Milan for for modeling. Oh, how and, nice! Um, when I moved to Milan, I didn't speak any English whatsoever. So it was real or Italian. It was really, really difficult for me to adjust because the culture was different. Plus, I didn't speak any English. I actually had a cultural shock for about three months. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was, it was really, really tough time for me because I, I felt like everyone thought that I was stupid. But just because, and I felt for some reason it was my own insecure, insecurities, obviously. I felt like everyone, when, when someone was laughing, they were laughing at me. <laughs> and that actually helped me to, to get tougher. I, I decided that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to uh, learn to speak English no matter what. And I, um, I didn't have the money for it, like to go to classes or anything. So what I did, I just bought English books, um, studying um, English, and uh, I rented a bunch of uh, American movies with subtitles, mm -hmm. an English subtitles, so I could actually see what they say, mm -hmm. see how it's written. And that actually helped me a lot. Within a couple of months, I've been, I was able to speak um, English uh, and. Uh, and yeah, all my insecurities were gone with, mm. with it. Well, Natasha, it certainly is an extraordinary path that you've taken to go from aviation to uh, design and fashion and uh, to make your way from Moscow to Milan. How did all of that set you up for making that transition to acting? Well, actually, while I was modeling in Milan, Europe, um, I booked commercial. Uh, that was shot like a mini Bond movie, and mm. I had to play this uh, um, sexy Bond girl uh, shoot, shooting a gun and driving a, a fast car and uh, flirting with boys. So it was it was uh, it was a very fun time and a new experience to me because I've never done that before. Mm -hmm. And the director kept, kept saying that that um, I have much full talent for acting and I should definitely pursue acting. Hmm. Uh, and I and I thought he was just saying that, but then what what started making me uh, think about this deeply that uh, there was another girl on the set that was doing a fairly sim similar um, playing similar 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 role, and uh, he didn't say anything to her. So I thought, oh, okay, maybe maybe he he really means it. And um, uh, and I do have a lot of fun. It felt natural to me to to do. Um, stuff that they were asking me to do, and I thought, oh, maybe this is my path. Maybe I should definitely pursue acting. And um, but of course, after that realization, it took many years until I could actually find a way to um, switch over. It took maybe like ten years after that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you go? How do you start? You're in a foreign country, and. Uh, uh, I didn't even know if there, uh, how you're supposed to start a new career. Uh, now I know that you're supposed to take acting classes, uh, hang out with fellow actors, and find out how to get an agent, manager, and all that. But um, over there it was a completely different story. And, yeah, I didn't uh, start taking acting classes until I actually moved to London and um, I found this amazing Lee Strasberg um, School, the method studio mm -hmm. was uh, um, was um, it, it just uh, affected me very deeply in a, in a very interesting way because my teacher uh, as a method actor she was making she was bringing out all these amazing emotions in mm -hmm. me that I never even knew that I had and 
that actually kind of um, help me lot in the future. That journey from London to Los Angeles to Hollywood, talk to us about that. Uh, well, I was living in London and uh, studying at the method school, and um, it seemed uh, and I, I, I seen a couple of agents, and no one really wanted to to sign me in London. And it was very frustrating because uh, I had a really thick Russian accent, and maybe that's the part why they didn't really want me at that time. And then I felt like, okay, if I want to make it, for some reason I believed, if I want to make it as an actor, I have to move to Hollywood because that's the heart of, of it all. And I wanted to be a uh, um, uh, television or movie actress, and not theater actress at that time. So... So I decided, okay, I have to, I have to move, I have to come here. So I came here for a visit, and I fell in love with Los Angeles, mm. and I never actually went back. It, I it, stayed here. I didn't go back. My my clothes probably somewhere still in London. <laughs> <laughs> my stuff, like I just t- totally moved here with the, my little uh, suitcase, and uh, that's that was it. I was like, oh my god, I feel like I'm on, I'm at home here. This is my Place to be. Your career has just taken off like wildfire since you moved to to Hollywood. I mean, tons of roles on on major hit shows. I mean, many of which um, I watched and I and I kind of miss like the unit. Um, but you know, because you took that step in faith, you 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 know, and that's what it takes. And it you know, it, it's it's it takes courage. But um, in, in, in faith, and, and, you know, and I hope people listening to your story are inspired to, to do something that they love and to, and to, you know, take that step of faith. Wait, I totally agree with you. And I actually didn't understand this little thing until I started studying, um, uh, uh, reading books, uh, Deepak Chopra and uh, Anthony Robbins and uh, Joe Vitale, uh, Silva, Method and um, uh, Abraham Hicks. Um, mm-hmm. I started to understand this deeply, even but because before I used to just uh, listen to my heart. And I'm a Pisces; my intuition is really high. So, and I wasn't really um, living my life by logic. I was just living my life by emotion. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's that explains why I would have like such a huge uh, up and a huge down in my life, like um, downs, uh, ups and downs. Um, and, uh, but now I kind of, uh, knowing how this works, I actually could uh, steer in the right direction so I don't have to fall hard on my, you know, bum when, when things are not going the right way. Um, and that actually helped. But you're right. You're totally right. You have to follow your your passion. You have to do things that you want. You can't think like, oh, I want to do. I want to play guitar. I want to be a musician, but uh, of a practice, pra, uh, you know, life shows that it's not really that successful. Everyone tries, kind of, uh, you know, uh, hits the failure, and uh, therefore I'm going to go and work. Uh, I don't know uh, as a salesperson, and then you kind of live your life miserably because you don't really earn that much money, and, and you are. Um, uh, you're just unhappy of mm-hmm. what you're doing. You think that you need to do this in order to do yourself, but it's not true. If you really, truly, passionately love something and you you actually pursue it, um, eventually uh, you you become successful and you get everything you want. Natasha, you're such a multifaceted person. Uh, just just the incredible journey. The the uh, just the just the challenge living that you've taken on these opportunities and not necessarily knowing where they might lead you. I know that since you've uh, been in Hollywood that uh, charities and philanthropic work have become a significant part of how you spend your time off the soundstage. Talk to us about some of the things that you're involved with in terms of charity work. Oh, this is a huge part of my life. Uh, Well, first of all, I have a baby and uh, it breaks my heart to hear when kids are hungry somewhere. Um, I just, I can't even, when I start thinking about it, I, I can't stop. I have to, like, really distract myself because otherwise I get in a deep depression of trying to, uh, you know, do something and help, and sometimes you feel like you're helpless. But um, I do, um, I um, volunteer 
um, uh, to do um, to um, but usually around Christmas and um, um, Thanksgiving uh, to help um, feed the homeless uh, kids or um, uh, homeless people in general. And um, I also I'm an ambassador for Amazon Forest uh, mm-hmm. because I think that's important that we we have to save our planet. We have to keep our planet uh, in um, in a great condition, and actually better condition that we um, we uh, started living in uh, because for to just to preserve it for our uh, future generations. Um, and uh, what's happening in the Amazon forest right now? It's really really sad because this is an incredible place, um, and, and it's just a, like a wonder of our planet. So we have to preserve it mm-hmm. for our future generations. I'm also doing, um, uh, I just uh, did some work in um, Puerto Rico. I went to support um, burns research for uh, kids' burns research because um, in many countries, if um, they don't have special centers for burn, uh, when some, when a kid gets burned, and um, they have to, for, especially in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. they don't have any institutes um, for that you know, facilities, so they they would have to uh, fly them out to uh, a mainland to treat the patient if someone got burned. Um, so oh. we we did some. We went to support. Um, it was a, a Domino tournament to um, help to raise money for that charity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you 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 travel a lot for these organizations. Is um, is there a a place that has really kind of transformed your life, either you know in traveling with these organizations or just on your own? travels as you've traveled through your life and you know is there a place that you've been to that's really just touched you well you know um every place that i go there's some some things that are really are really sad and 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 touch you deeply that you want to just drop everything and and you know help people uh or even animals like there there are many countries that um don't have any uh, sort of um, organization that take takes care of homeless animals and it's really sad to go to countries and see poor animals running on the streets maybe injured or mm-hmm. or hungry and uh it's just it's really hard. I hope one day we can actually figure out how to how to take care of all of problems. And is there? Do you have a, um, a a favorite place you like to go? Just a, you know, place that that's that's really fun for you that you like to just go and unwind. Yes, I love tropical beaches. That's <laughs> like when when I meditate sometimes in the evening, I, I'll just I picture myself somewhere on the beach, and uh, that just really relaxes me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm so with you there. I'm so with you there. <laughs> right. Yay. Yeah. So, so what's next for you, my dear? What's uh, what's? Do you have any other um, acting projects coming up? Uh, I mean, the Aveta role is um, it, it's now a, a contracted role, and so you're uh, you're going to be a you know a staple or fixture on on True Blood. But um, are you doing other other things? Any stage work or anything in the future for you? Well, um, so well as you said, uh, True Blood started starts shooting maybe uh, the end of this year, beginning of the next year. Uh, meantime, uh, I just finished a movie called The Black Bell. Um, hopefully, we'll hit uh, Sam Dance Festival festival with that one mm-hmm. in January. Um, and then uh, the rumor has it, so I don't know. It's not <laughs> written in stone yet, but yeah, that would be great. Um, then. Uh, um, what else? Oh, I've, I've got I've signed on for a, a few different projects. One of them is sci-fi trilogy, um, very interesting. Um, and, uh, I think uh, uh, Maureen. Uh, no, I, I, I'd rather not say names because I tend to <laughs> pr- mispronounce them. <laughs> Noreen, Noreen. I think his name is Noreen from Lost. Ah, um, okay. Right, he's signed on to that one so I'm very excited to work with him 
he's a, such a great actor. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I would love to find an amazing acting. Um, uh, maybe I'll do some theater work because that actually helps to um, to move your career further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly look forward to seeing more of you, either on uh, you know the the big screen or little screen or or, or live stage. And uh, thank you so much. Yes, Basio Bolshoya for joining us, Natasha Alam today. Welcome back. When I first heard our next guest sing, I knew immediately that we'd have to invite her to appear on our show. Elizabeth Elmine has one of the most authentic and powerful voices I've ever heard. She's a classically trained artist and has studied with internationally renowned voice coaches in London and throughout Canada. And Elizabeth joins us today from her home in Toronto. Welcome to World Footprints. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You, as I mentioned, you you have a, a wonderful, authentic voice, Elizabeth, and your background is amazing. You I know you started singing at the tender age of seven. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got started and your personal journey along the way. Uh, sure. I actually was living in a small town called Uxbridge uh, when I was younger. My family has a horse farm, and uh, my mom was really good about putting my sister and I into as many activities as she could, and... She saw an ad in the local paper for the Uxbridge Youth Course, which is a small children's choir in Uxbridge. Mm -hmm. And I went out to an audition, and the lady who ran the choir um, said to my mom, you know, has she ever thought about taking a vocal lesson? And we booked the first lesson, and I went in, and just absolutely at seven years old was just, like, in love. <laughs> um, and uh, so I actually trained with the same coach uh, who I met when I was seven until I was 16. So... Um, um, had a lot of training with her and then moved on to other people sort of more in the opera field. But, um, but yeah, I had a great time in local courses when I was younger, and, and I really learned a lot from, from that first lesson. Did you always want to be a classical artist, or did you consider crossing over to other genres, or uh, what was your thinking, and, and where are you now? It kind of developed uh, sort of with my lessons. The the lady who was my teacher from the time I was 7 till I was 16 put me into a lot of different things locally. I did a lot of musical theater. Um, I played Annie when I was younger and also got to perform at Massey Hall in Toronto and sent in a little audition tape and got to sing the Canadian premiere of the song When You Believe from the Prince of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And that was really the time I was, I think I was 14 or 15 then, when that was the moment where I decided, okay, this is something I want to do for sure. Um, it was my first big performance. It was in front of a uh, full house at Massey Hall, which seats like 4,000, and there was a 1,000-voice children's choir behind me. So I had never really thought about it, to be honest, before that. I always thought it was something that I really loved, and it was something, a fun hobby to have. But that was the moment where I really decided, this is I could do this for a living. I want to do this for a living. When you're talking about your performances when you're younger, but you're being very modest, you actually performed with the Canadian National Opera or the Youth Opera. I did, yeah. Um, after Massey Hall, the lady who was teaching me had sort of felt that she had sort of taken me as far as I could go, and that was one of the places that she thought would benefit me was the youth course of the Canadian Opera Company. So I spent two seasons with them, and I was working with a wonderful voice coach uh, from the University of Windsor and another voice coach from the Royal Conservatory in Toronto. Um, and I got to play a lot of different roles with the youth chorus. I was Hansel and Hansel and Gretel, and I was one of the three ladies in the Magic Flute. And um, So that was great training. It was the youth chorus, so everyone was around the same age as me, 15 to 18 or 20, I think it was. Um, so I got to meet a lot of people who liked the same things that I did and, mm -hmm. and uh, really got into classical music then when I was about 15 or 16. Who were some of the uh, classical singers and perhaps popular musicians uh, growing up that influenced you and even to this day uh, uh, musicians who, 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 who shaped your style? When I was younger, my dad has a really great vinyl collection. Um, so when I was younger, I listened to uh, singer-songwriters from the 60s and 70s like um, Carol King, Joni mm -hmm. Mitchell, uh, things like that. A lot of, my dad has a lot of Beatles records, which were great. Um, I loved Ella Fitzgerald when I was younger, Judy Garland, 
And then when I went into classical music, um, my coach would give me a lot of, you know, Maria Callas and um, sort of established opera singers. But someone who I really admired when I was in full classical training was um, Isabel Barakdarian. She's a younger performer, but she's one of the principal sopranos with the youth, uh, sorry, with the Canadian Opera Company in Toronto now. Mm. Um, so I actually got to meet her a couple months ago at another performance that I got to go see in Toronto, and um, I just really admire her. I think she she worked really hard uh, from the time she was a teenager to pursue opera, and I think if I had decided to stay with opera, she would be someone that I would sort of model myself after, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I want to um, go back to your time when you were in London. I know you spent some time in London to uh, perfect and pursue your craft. What what took you there, and what was that like training over there? It was fun, actually. I went there the first time um, I went there was when I was 18 and went to complete my first year of university um, and actually took lessons with a great teacher in London over there and was still very much into the classical side of things the first time I went over. And then the second time I went over was in 2008, and I wasn't really sure if classical music was the right thing for me anymore, and I got to meet with a couple of music managers, and I went to as many shows as I possibly could. I saw Amy Winehouse at the Coco in London, and um, and a lot of more contemporary artists as well. So mm-hmm. the first time I was there, it was mainly focused on the classical side of things, and um, going to the opera in London is unbelievable. Um, and then the second time, I really wanted to just try and try and figure out, you know, what else I could sound like, because I had been training from the time I was young to sing a certain kind of music and sound a certain kind of way. And uh, when I went over the second time, I didn't know anyone in London. I was living right in the middle of the city, and I just kind of wanted to see what I could figure out, you know, and experiment a little bit. So Mm -hmm. London was a great place to do that for sure. Elizabeth, you've had a chance to go from southern Ontario to becoming a world traveler because of because of your music. Talk to us about some of the places that you've been and and, and, and some of your favorite uh, destinations uh, uh, that you've had a chance to visit through through your music. Um, well, I traveled quite a bit when I went over for school. Um, I was in a, a chamber choir, and we got to perform all over England. Um, I've also, just with my friends even, just been to you know Paris and Amsterdam and Rome and Milan. I was really lucky when I went over for my first year of university that my parents were really open to supporting me and, and allowing me to, to take these you know weekend trips away. And um, it really brought some of the things that I've always loved to life. I mean, standing in the Louvre uh, when, I was, when I went with my class to Paris and seeing every painting that we studied in second semester in one room in the Louvre or going to um, the Secret Annex or Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, and I've always loved um, her diary. So really, I think those things maybe aren't directly related to music, but they're certainly things that helped me to grow up and helped me realize, um, you know, Things that inspire me, I guess, and things that I'm, that I'm that I'm interested in. So I guess that, in a way, relates back to music. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've been really lucky to travel quite a bit at a young age, so it really helped me grow up. I think so. Well, I, I mean, I think you know, music. Even though a trip may not directly be tied to music, music is is really a, ver- a universal language, and mm-hmm. you know, it brings people of all cultures together, and even acts uh, as a teaching tool to to learn a foreign language. Yeah, I. Um, I have a friend that I traveled with who perfected his Spanish by listening to uh, uh, Spanish music and, and watching Spanish soup operas. Um, but but I know you know a lot of um, uh, people abroad uh, learn to speak English by listening to uh, American music. So it's you know it's 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 a wonderful art form that that really complements the art of travel, the art of living and, uh, you know, is very universal. Mm -hmm. No, I can relate to that for sure. I remember when I was in classical training with one of my teachers, he was talking about Italian because so much of opera is written in Italian, right? So he was talking about how how forceful they are and how, um, 
not in your face, but very enthusiastic speakers. And I never really <laughs> understood until I went to Italy mm -hmm. and was sort of walking around Rome and Milan and listening to people speak. And I was like, okay, see, now I understand. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely can relate to that. It certainly opens your eyes to different languages, and that certainly helps with opera especially. Now, particularly with uh, opera, you think of the uh, great opera houses around the world, at least I do, in Paris, uh, even Sydney from a, from a modern standpoint. Is there a place, a uh, dream place that you have in mind where, where you haven't performed that someday you'd love to perform? Um, when I was in the opera, definitely the opera house in Paris um, is beautiful. In terms of what I'm singing now, I think one of the places that I would love to perform would be uh, Carnegie Hall in New York City. Mm. Um, acoustics are spectacular, and it has such a history, and it's had so many amazing people play there. I think it would be quite an honor to be listed in the same uh, same breath as the people who've played there. That would be pretty pretty amazing. So, what 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 are you? What is your style of singing right now? I'm definitely, I'm, I've moved away from classical music. I'm lucky enough to get to work with a producer in Toronto who's kind of helping me figure that out. Um, I have a voice that is sounds classical just because of all my training. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely falls into the easy listening or adult contemporary kind of easy pop mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I love big melodies, big choruses and ballads and things like that. I've always been drawn to, to quieter music, so... Um, definitely along those lines. It's still something that I'm figuring out because I was so focused on classical music for such a long time. Uh, but I'm just trying to listen to as much as I possibly can and, and figure out what I like, basically. So. Elizabeth, Toronto is uh, one of our favorite cities, and uh, we spent some time there this uh, this summer. And uh, just give us some insights into the music scene in Toronto and uh, how it's evolved and what you enjoy about it because Toronto is a global city with 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 so many cultural influence and I can imagine that the music itself is very eclectic and draws on things that you know go well beyond uh, English Canada. Toronto's great for that for sure. There are there are always um, busking areas and all the subways where you get a lot of great people who play a whole you know variety of instruments. Um, it's great walking walking around the city and every little part of the city, like Little Italy or Chinatown, you get a different sort of influence. Um, the great thing is there are a lot of independent artists in Toronto and a lot of smaller venues that you can play, um, like the Bread and Circus or Drake Hotel or something like that, you know, and a lot of artists get together and sort of uh, put, put each other on the same bill. So you can hear three or four different amazing artists in one night who aren't necessarily the same kind of genre. You know, you can have a jazz artist or a pop artist, and it all still kind of fits together. And I think all of the little venues in Toronto really cater to that. So there are tons of places, at least i found, for independent artists to go out and get themselves heard, which is really nice because that's one of the main things that I have to work on right now is getting myself out there, getting my singing out there, and just trying to meet people and hopefully get some interest going. So it really helps that the city um, is so interested in new music and independent music. So I'm lucky that I live here for sure. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, and, and I think that's one of the things we love about uh, about Toronto as well. And I'm just wondering what you're finding there, uh, you know, w with other uh, younger people coming up, new artists, you know, are people kind of returning to the authentic uh, craft of songwriting and singing, or are they kind of taking an easy way out with uh, technology? I think a lot of people still really value um, live musicians, having live musicians in the studio and, and sitting down um, sort of by themselves or with one co-writer and really trying to make a, a song that, that means something, you know. Um, it was an adjustment for me, for sure, because I'm used to uh, recitals and having a pianist play for me. Um, I've never actually sung with a track or anything like that. It's always been live musicians. And if there was something that I was singing with with the youth chorus of the COC, um, it was a smaller orchestra set up or, you know, it's always been live. So when I first started writing with my producer in Toronto, I couldn't actually afford to have live musicians come in and play on the track. Mm -hmm. So the tracks that you'll hear on my MySpace are actually um, it's called programming. So it's 
they tape a live musician, say a vinyl, violinist, you know, playing the notes on a scale, and then they put it into the keyboard and use those notes to create a violin line. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's definitely a mix of both. There really are some great musicians that still play on a regular basis, and certainly I prefer to sing along with um, with a live musician. But um, I'm lucky enough to get to work with the guy in Toronto who can make all of those things sound real and authentic, you know, make the the programming piece for the drums sound like a drum set or make the um, strings sound like real strings. So yeah. I think you can use that technology in a great way. I think some people maybe, you know, don't take the time to do that, but I think you, you can use it in the right way. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's very different from, you know, people who will just bang out a note and then add computer-generated noise. Right. Um, behind it, it doesn't sound like an in, you know instrument. Um, right. You know what you're doing is is very different. Now, what what's next for you, and where can people go to learn more about you and and follow your uh, your schedule, see where you're playing, so they uh, they can uh, support you. I have a MySpace page up that I manage myself, uh, which is myspacecom Elizabethelming. And I also have a Facebook page. Um, so I try and respond to everything I get on YouTube and every message on Facebook. And um, the next big thing I'm singing at is the Royal Winter Fair in Toronto. Um, I actually get to sing at the opening ceremonies mm. with two of Canada's elite dressage riders in the pas de deux. So that'll be really fun. It'll be uh, the Rico in the Rico Coliseum, which holds... I think seven or eight thousand people. So it'll mm-hmm. be the biggest show I've done to date. So pretty exciting. So awesome, and I'm sure you'll put that on YouTube. I will for sure. Yeah. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. Well, Elizabeth Elmine, thank you so much for joining us today on World Footprints Radio, and we look forward to uh, following your career and hearing more from you in the coming coming weeks, months, years. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really happy to, to talk to you guys. Thank you. Welcome back. Antonio Graceffo, also known as the Monk from Brooklyn, is a fellow career transitionist. He left Wall Street years ago to study martial arts overseas, and during his journey, he discovered a deeper purpose. With books, TV, and film projects under his belt, he has become a one-man media empire of sorts as he travels the world in fulfillment of his passion. Antonio joins us from Vietnam today. Welcome, Antonio. Hey, thank you. It's good to hear a voice from America. Yeah, well, hey, uh, man, you are thousands of miles from us here in D.C., and so it's just great to be able to make the connection with uh, all of this technology. What led you to leave Wall Street after 9-11 for the Far East to pursue your interest in martial arts and uh, become this martial arts anthropologist of sorts? <laughs> well, you know, the thing is that on 9-11, you know, 3,000 people died. And, you know, everybody, every one of us has dreams, we have desires, and we say, someday I'm going to do this, someday I'm going to do that. And I realized for those 3,000 people, someday was never going to come. Mm-hmm. So that so that prompted you. I mean, that was kind of a um, an awakening for for you uh, in some sorts. Now, you, you grew up in New York City, you know, a place where you can really experience the world in five boroughs. Yet now you're you're a bit of a globetrotter. And um, is there is there a place that you now think of as home more than New York City? And if so, why is that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I like being in Bangkok. I like being in Hong Kong. I like Saigon a lot. I like Taiwan a lot. But, but no, New, New York is still capital of the world. <laughs> now, what was it about growing up in New York, uh, in your opinion, that kind of set the stage for what you're doing now? Because uh, you've got people from all over over the world. You can become a mini ambassador in uh, your own right in uh, your old city there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I... I since early childhood, I, I had an interest in martial arts. I had an interest in anthropology. I was really young. My grandmother used to buy me books about um, Speak and, and Burton and, and these people that were exploring, uh, you know, Victorian age explorers in Africa and things like that. And I was always fascinated by that. And she was a theater director, and I remember they put on the play uh, 1001 Arabian Nights and Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. And so I kind of grew up with these stories, and I just thought, man, I want to go out and, you know, have adventures like that. So from early childhood, the, 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 the stage was already set for that. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, our, my background was the same. I kind of traveled vicariously through books and um, through the arts. So uh, it's good to know that, you know, I wasn't the only, I guess, armchair traveler back in the day. <laughs> Now, counting counting English, you speak nine other languages, and um, I know that your grandmother also inspired your love for languages. And I'll say to you, ni hao ma, uh, Anton. <laughs> that, that's, that's the extent of my Mandarin. <laughs> that and I can count to five. But um, how did you become so fluent in, in, in many of these languages, and what tips do you have for others who, you know, I mean, children are kind of like sponges, and so to learn a new language when you're young um, is, is the best time. But as an adult, how, how, what, what tips would you have to, for an adult who wants to become fluent in another language? Well, I, I'll tell you, look, the, the big thing about having exposure to other languages as a child, because we spoke Italian and Spanish at our grandmother's house, and she also knew German and French, so I had a lot of exposure to languages. The main thing that that did was just create an interest in me that from very early on, when I saw Chinese people on the bus in New York, I would just say, ah, what are they saying? <laughs> Why did you know what they were saying? And it just created this interest in languages. And I, and I think that that's the benefit. Really, in terms of academics, there's really no benefit to learning a language younger. It doesn't help you learn other languages later. That's kind of a, a myth that a lot of people believe. But uh, all the languages I learned, I learned them through extremely hard work, just sitting at a desk, you know, hours and hours and hours per day studying high percentages of it. Yeah. Now, it, it it takes a lot of discipline to master those languages, and it takes a lot of discipline to study martial arts and immerse yourself in all of these different fighting systems. Uh, Talk to us about about that journey through through the world of martial arts and uh, these various fighting systems. And, and and I know you got started as a kid through kickboxing uh, back in uh, your youth, and you were a pretty good boxer back in the day, and probably still are. So talk to us about your journey through this world of fighting arts. Well, I started when I was about eleven or twelve with uh, American kickboxing, and my teacher was H. David Collins in Bluntville, Tennessee. And uh, from there, when I was in the military, and I started boxing, and I boxed um, at about uh, forty-two fights, I think, mm-hmm. during the time I was in the military. And then I always had an interest in martial arts, and I practiced it. But then, when I went to school in Germany later, I was going to university in Germany, and I kind of had to stop doing everything for about four years where I studied really hard um, to, to learn my languages and to learn my linguistics. And then I got back into martial arts again in my 30s. And um, I was training, actually, before 9-11 came. I was planning to try and get into mixed martial arts, actually fight in a mixed martial arts competition. And I would hired trainers in New York City and started learning some Muay Thai and boxing again and, and, and uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and things. And then... Uh, when 9-11 happened and I decided that I was going to leave and follow my heart, my heart was that I wanted to go to the Shaolin Temple in China. So that was my, I first went to Taiwan to learn Chinese and then I went to China to study at Shaolin and it, it just went on from there. After hmm. yeah, I want to come back to, to some of the things that you talked about, but in studying all of these different fighting systems and uh, gaining black belt proficiency in, in, in some of them, have uh, you had any that have appealed to you more so than others, or have there been some that have been more humbling to uh, kind of learn and grow and develop in? Well, the, um, for my personal training, what I actually do to keep fit in the art that I always stick with is uh, Muay Thai and Khmer boxing. And um, if I'm in Cambodia, I'm training in Khmer boxing every day. If I'm in other countries, I'm doing it every day. That's just, just my fitness, and that's the the arts that I really enjoy. There's a lot of other arts that I've covered for my show, Commercial Arts Odyssey. And so the arts that I do for my own fitness uh, and for myself, it's the Khmer boxing and the Muay Thai. And I do Khmer boxing when I'm in Cambodia. I do Muay Thai pretty much everywhere else where I go. But there's a lot of other arts that I feature on my show, Martial Arts Odyssey, or when the TV networks call me and they want to film something interesting and I take them to 
very short. Mm-hmm. No, we wanted to ask you, you know, we're talking about the show, the Martial Arts Odyssey, and, and other shows that you've worked on. I know that you uh, happen to consult for uh, the show of a, a friend of ours who's been on our show, Samantha Brown, and uh, the Samantha Brown uh, Asia, I guess, um, series. Talk about some of the, the shows that, that you've actually worked on or consulted for. I've worked on um, Human Weapon, Fight Quest, Samantha Brown's Asia, Kill Armand, uh, Digging for the Truth, that's on History Channel. And I just did a show called Wow, which is a travel show that's on uh, Wealth TV Network in the United States. And worked on um, uh, The Art of Fighting, uh, a lot of a lot of shows. Um, yeah, a lot of shows, mostly in the United States, and then a few, a few in Europe, and then a lot of Asian shows. Mm-hmm. You've also uh, become a prolific writer, um, in addition to all the other things that you're doing. And I'm wondering when you have time to rest, frankly. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you, you've written the, the Monk from Brooklyn, Adventures in uh, Formosa, Rediscovering the uh, Khmers. I mean, just a series of, of books. And you really um, seem to immerse yourself in ways that few people can really imagine. Talk to us a little bit about your writings and your current project. Well, what, what I've done, since I've been in Asia, I've kept a pretty meticulous diary. And so that's helped a lot. And the other thing I do meticulously is that I keep up with my correspondence. I get about 200 pieces of correspondence a day between email, Facebook, and everything else that comes in from people who read the, the books or, or watch the videos or see the TV shows. And what I'm and I answer those all myself and a lot of them then I turn into magazine articles because if someone had a question, I think oh maybe a lot of people had that question. And so it winds up leading to me writing a magazine article. And then I store everything I've written and um, about once a year I sit down and write a book. <laughs> so uh-huh. I've done, uh, six but I've been over here uh, yeah, I've been over here nine years and uh, my sixth book just came out. Uh, last month, Warrior, uh, Warrior Odyssey. Now, along the way, you've had some pretty extraordinary travels and adventures at the Shaolin Temple in China, and now you're in Vietnam. Talk to us about some of the memorable and transformative uh, adventures that you've had, and you know, talk to us about why you're in Vietnam today. Um, well, Vietnam is one of the most fascinating countries in the world, in my opinion. It's the fastest-growing economy in the world. It's a huge country. It's, I, I call it the biggest country that people don't know anything about. You know, you know, 90 million people. I mean, this is this is in the top in 10 or 15 countries in the world in size. Fastest growing economy. Most of the people are say 25 years old and younger, and um, it, it's it's just just hustling, bustling. You can hear it growing. You can literally hear it growing and developing while you're sitting here, and it's so exciting because. Um, I'm teaching at a university outside of Saigon. When I go to the university, I'm the only white person that they've seen since uh, people were flying over dropping bombs on them. Mm-hmm. And I always make sure to point out that that was probably French bombs and not Americans, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> bloody French. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's why Vietnam is exciting to me. And then the, the language is so fascinating. And, you know, the only thing most Americans know is about the war, and most of the books that have ever been written about Vietnam are either written about the war or there's maybe 10% of the books were written by uh, Americans living in Hanoi because foreigners were not allowed to live in Saigon until just very, very recently. So I may wind up doing a book about Saigon. I'm not sure that that's what I'm planning to do, but I may wind up doing a book about Saigon just because there haven't been very many books written about living in Saigon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was just curious about, you know, all the travels you do, Antonio, and, and, you know, some of our listeners may think, oh, my goodness, you know, a single guy, um, American guy in, in Saigon, and, you know, is he safe? And, you know, you know some people may, may raise those questions. And so um, I'm just wondering if, you know, with your skills, your martial art uh, skills, if you've really had to use them at any time during the course of your travels um, in in real life, if they've ever come in handy. Well, I would say, it, well, well, I'd like to preempt that by saying that in most of Southeast Asia, there's almost zero violent street crime. So just, just right off the bat, like Thailand's unbelievably safe, and Taiwan is so safe, it's insane. And um, 
Cambodia, there's there's some street crime, and uh, Philippines is a lot. It's probably the most dangerous place that I've, I've I've worked, including I went straight from the war zone of Burma to working in the Philippines. <laughs> the Philippines is oh more dangerous than the war zone in Burma. <laughs> but um, but as far as martial arts, once I got I got jumped in um, Taiwan of all places, and 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 I mean no one no one's ever been. Jumped in Taiwan, I probably made history, but I get jumped by uh, like a motorcycle gang in Taiwan uh, uh, like seven or eight years ago, and, and I beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone catch that on tape? I'm curious. You know, YouTube phenomenal or anything like that. Um, that I find that surprising. I hope it's the someday. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Obviously, they didn't know who uh, you were at that point. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, on, on yeah, a, you know, you know. Yeah, you know, you know, I actually felt seriously it was almost it was a lesson in Buddhism too, though, because I felt this a lot of compassion for them because I started thinking, you know, these kids, you know, they were smart, at, smart alecky kids that go out on scooters and they start fights with people, and then if a fight starts, they call their friends on their cell phone, and then before you know it, you're fighting you know, 30 people, oh, and so they are, they're bad, but they're probably not generally bad because like, they're probably even going to school and and. They were even college students, you know, full-time students, but just they do these bad things. And I kind of felt bad in a way because I'm like, you know, they have no idea that this is how this was going to turn out. <laughs> we could jump the one guy that was just going <laughs> to fight and fight and fight and fight. I know there's a real serious side to uh, the travels that you've undertaken because you've uh, seen people in pretty impoverished conditions. Uh, you've been to countries where political oppression is still a major issue. And I'd like to know how this has affected your your consciousness about some of the issues that are facing some of the world's people and how this has affected you and what you're doing as uh, you travel and pursue your passion. Yeah, it's affected me a great deal. Um, the war in Burma, I'd say more than anything else, really, I was very traumatized. You know, I was in and out of the war zone for six months and and on my final trip, um, I just came out and just kind of collapsed on the bed, and and I was just I was I was so shaken by that, and uh, I went from there to the Philippines to work on an ambulance crew. So I came out of the, the Burma situation and I went to the Philippines. I went to paramedic school, and the Philippines, I mean, just, just, it, it, they are the most wonderful, literally the most people I've met probably in travels or Filipinos. There is a party. Every, every car accident is a party. Everything's a party. They're just the happiest people. They live in the most horrible country in the world. The, the poverty, the corruption, the violence. It's unbelievable. And then I was right in the middle of that. And then um, after paramedic school, I was volunteering on the ambulance, working in the worst neighborhood. The, the very first car that we got was for a small boy, like six-year-old boy, that had drowned in a drainage uh, tunnel. And presumed drowned in the drainage tunnel. No one didn't know for sure if he was dead, if he was whatever. And I was the only one who was swim qualified, and I was absolutely willing to dive in the water and go looking for him. But I just, I had to know. I said, look, I have to know. I'm looking for a little boy, and not for a body. I need to know how long he's been missing, and put in information. And, and, and it was just more, it was more trouble just, just seeing what people need to lose and he fell in that drainage. It was because his family was so poor, and they lived in a place where there's open drainage ditches. Mm. Yeah, and you just see how this poverty, this, this poverty and corruption just destroys people. And, and and I know you're doing uh, some humanitarian work to bring awareness to, to a lot of the issues that um, uh, people that you, you encounter uh, are experiencing. Talk a little bit about the humanitarian work you're doing. Yeah, mostly, most of my humanitarian, other than, other than working on the ambulance crew in the Philippines, I don't do a lot of hands-on. I do, it's mostly, it's reporting, you know, reporting or making videos. So I went into Burma, into the war zone. I did 43 YouTube videos inside of Burma. It was really a great experience. And I do a lot of tribal people, a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of remote areas uh, with the tribal people. And, and Antonio, you you uh, you have a lot going on. You know, books, TV, films. Um, you're you're all over the place. For those who want to follow your adventures, where can they go to 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 keep up with you? And my nickname is Brooklyn Monk. 
So my YouTube channel is Brooklyn Monk One. My podcast is called Brooklyn Monk in Asia. You can find that uh, on on Google. You can look Brooklyn Monk in Asia podcast. So Brooklyn Brooklyn Monk is is the keyword and and speakingadventure.com. Antonio Graceffo joining us from from Vietnam today. Thank you so much for spending some time with us on World Footprints Radio. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed our show today and as always we look forward to spending quality travel time with you. And we certainly look forward to connecting with you during the week on our social network. So follow us on those platforms and sign up for our newsletters. And don't forget to check out our travel deals at worldfootprints.com. We're Tanya Nee and Fitzpatrick, and we'll see you on the air again next week, same time, same frequency. And until then, we wish you blue skies and purposeful travel that leaves positive footprints one step at a time. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.